ready? Is my audio good? Something? Okay, good. Um, yeah, we're going to talk about more ways than one skin a cat. Um, for the last two months, I've been doing research on attack graph analysis, and we're going to discuss from, uh, pretty much my whole process that I went through to think through this process. Uh, towards the end, we're going to discuss tools, we're going to discuss what's open source, what's closed, some of the issues I found, and also some of the gap analysis that I'm identifying so far. Uh, and then if you're interested to provide feedback, I have my little feedback book. If I'm done quick enough, um, I'd like to get some ideas on uh, where this can be used. Um, so, oh yes, by the way, the real Joe Klein, I'm only mentioning this because I, there's a political writer by the name of Joe Klein. On a regular basis, people send really nasty stuff to my Twitter channel. Okay, That's so... It is very, very funny. I, wait a second, that was you. Where, what? No, just kidding. Okay, scientific hooligan since the mid-70s. We won't go into that. Um, pretty much played with lots of stuff over the years. Uh, some of these ideas have been percolating for a while. Uh, the idea of being able to identify where the attacker is coming from or use this as a method to optimize the attack into an organization, uh, to be able to use it for forensics. Uh, Cardinal Ownage basically this discussion about how low can you go as far as what does multiple vulnerabilities really mean, not just to a system, but to a whole network. A lot of people make assumptions that our, our CNA process, we put together a single machine and we say it's secure and we hope we can manage it well and then we focus over on another machine and we hope we can focus that well but we really don't know what the interactions between multiple lows or moderates or even one single high what the implication of that is on a, uh, on a network. And then I had a discussion about Armitage and we we're discussing the whole idea of wouldn't it be cool if we could identify what the infrastructure was and then launch bots within uh, Armitage to be able to do some of these activities to very quickly go through and do penetration testing and also be able to map it. So if you're performing a penetration test, you can provide your path through the network, but with uh, enough knowledge, be able to also show, oh, here are other things that possibly could have been compromised on the way that we just didn't have time because of um, our time. Um, also some miter, and you guys always motivate me for this stuff. Skinny a cat. Go ahead, so I have to say aw. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Look, there was no IPv6 in the first five minutes. When? Um, <clears throat> learning style. One of the problems that uh, I noticed with uh, a lot of uh, the tools we have is the visualization is not appropriate and there are strategies. I, I'm a visual learner, so I have to see something before I actually take action on it uh, to be able to process it. So one of the things that I did, and we also have auditory, which is 30% of the population, kinesthetic because you can tell because they walk up and have to touch you every time. Does anybody know mouse? Uh, never mind. Okay, um, so for a long time I've been spending time doing um, these type of graphs, spiderweb graphs, because this is how I learn, is I put together these crazy graphs. This happens to be a IDS basics and implementation graph uh, detail that I created about five years ago that when I'm mentoring somebody in IDS, I hand this to them and say, here's the basic stuff and here's the additional books and all the other things. And I do this regularly. I do it on when I'm creating information, presentations, when I'm capturing books and stuff, I'll put it in this framework, that way I can share it with different people. And also brainstorming, we use this a lot in brainstorming. Uh, processes, I'll do this with writing scripts, the um, how to do tunnel enumeration with, okay, I'll use that word, IPv6. Um, this is where I spent probably a month off and on just doing the pseudocode in this before I actually implemented code. Um, a couple tools, and I think we've talked about them before, a couple open source tools, uh, FreeMind and FreePlane, 
good products, and also MindJet. One of the cool things about MindJet is if you put together a framework like this, you can then convert it. You can basically shift screens and put project dates against it, and we'll actually generate a Microsoft project for you. So just kind of like a hint. So I like doing this. This makes my life easier. I can visualize something. I, I have an idea what's going on. Skinning the cat. No awe? Oh, God, you guys. Okay, so the next issue is attack trees. I do attack trees, which is really a formal way of describing the security against systems. Last year I had two DARPA projects and several customer projects that were from an architectural standpoint, and one was it had never been even addressed before. It was a new class of technology, a new class of interface, a new class of everything else. So we had to create attack trees. Has anybody used attack trees in the past? Only the shady guys over there. Nice. Just kidding. Um, first thing what we do is we identify the goal. The goal is on the top. Then we identify, we brainstorm on what are the strategies. Then we identify you know, additional strategies, additional strategies until we get to the bottom. Once we create this tree, very similar to the last trees we talked about, we identify if it's possible or impossible. Um, when Bruce Schneier wrote this, he was uh, uh, really thinking that it was a place in time. I have seen others do this and say possible, impossible. Um, I now use probabilities on this because, as an example, some of these attacks may not be probable today, but if certain supporting technologies occur, then it would be probable. So I always provide this as one of the items. Another thing is to well, assign a probability and do the uh, calculation. The other thing is to, for calculation of goals, if you notice that there's an end down here, both of those must take place for me to meet the uh, objective above. We also have dotted lines, which may or may not be optimal based on this time through it. Um, by the way, otherwise, if we don't have an end over there, we're using an OR. Next thing is I do is I define, is there a special equipment required or not special equipment? If I have to go out and buy a software control radio, and I have to pull up a Linux kernel, and I have to write a device driver, and I have to do something else, it may be possible, but the cost, time, or effort may be too high to actually perform that. So I have to include that as one of the descriptions in here. So is there equipment or is there not? Is there something in the open source community that I can use or not? Uh, the next thing is the actual cost of attack. If creating that software control radio and doing the device driver and everything else was good to cost $100,000 and, and that was the optimal path, the client or whomever, myself, whomever, may say, hey, this is the optimal path, go for it. Others may say, you know, maybe this isn't very workable. Um, so you can also use cost. Ease and difficulty of use. Ooh, did I go backwards? Yes, I went backwards. Ease and difficulty of implementation. Some things are easy, hard. What's the expense versus inexpense? Uh, you may be given a budget to actually mitigate these issues. Um, invasive versus non-invasive. Are you going to have to physically go into the facility and plug something in, or are you going to drop a piece of uh, a phishing email and get caught by Aaron's Fish Me program, right? Um, also, is there legal and uh, il uh, I illegal to do it? Probability of detection if you're trying to be stealth. And also, what's the time period? Is it going to take a day? Is it going to take a few milliseconds? Or is this, this a project you're going to have to do over a year? So once we define tax trees, where do you apply it? If you're developing new systems and application, this is a great exercise. I include this with my documentation now so that when the client starts pushing back on I'm not going to justify the funding towards this or that, I provide them this as evidence that these are some of the risks and these are some of the issues they have to look at. From a red team, uh, a team standpoint, even if you have partial knowledge, sometimes this is enough to tell you, you know, 
maybe I should do a physical versus, you know, or maybe I should do a wireless versus a wired con um, connection, or maybe I should do a fish. You really don't know until you start researching that information. And also, um, define uh, defenses. You may want to put up a new system. By going through this process, you can start, you can turn the tables around and say, hey, by using this process, I can say it's going to cost an adversary approximately this amount of money to do this particular activity, and we're going to spend one-tenth of it to provide defense. Is that a good return on investment? That's a question. Um, some of the problems, this takes a lot of experience and a lot of knowledge and a lot of research. There are people out there that can do this very well. There are people that start the process and miss things and unfortunately put us at risk or put themselves at risk. I, I've been on, I've basically, one of them that I did took months because you would do the activity as a group activity, you would document it, you'd set it aside for a couple days or a couple weeks, you'd come back to it, you would had everybody done additional research, you apply more information. So it's a, it's a very um, intense process if it's a big environment. Um, tools, Visio, you can do Visio. There is a open source tool called Attack Graph CMU. Well, thank you. Um, told me what time it was. Uh, the also Microsoft has the SDL threat attack modeling tool. Realize it's really not defined as for attacks, but it can be very, very useful if you're trying to provide a framework to attack a Microsoft-only environment. Uh, good tool, and there is no cost to the two in the bottom. This is an attack graph from a defense standpoint. As you can see, I've documented that the inbound ports, SSH, really need to be blocked, and the uh, RSH, which should have been turned off on the machine, my personal opinion, the client didn't want to turn it off, uh, that too needed to be blocked. So this was actually a hand-done um, configuration. And by the way, I've got links on all this stuff if you want to do additional research to the NIST documents on risk assessment and for enterprises. This is the Microsoft product that allows you to do attack modeling. Uh, they're using a STRAD threat model. Um, They've been nice and kind enough to fill the threat model with examples and ideas and frameworks. So it's a little bit easier to go through this particular process. Um, they even make a, if you were at Black Hat two years ago, they were giving out uh, playing cards with examples of this to try to mentally walk you through the process of doing an attack graph, a, a threat model uh, for an application or a system or a group of systems. Again, another free product. Okay, so where do you gain the knowledge to start walking this process through? One is if you can grab a copy of that playing deck. It'll, it's very, very helpful, the Microsoft playing deck. The other is the KPAC um, database from MITRE. If you haven't seen it, and yes, I am on, offline, so I'm waiting for it to crash. What they have is high level issues. You know, what does a data leak look like? What are some of the issues you're going to have to be aware of? What are some of the interactions between other systems? Resource depletion, what are some of the things that I need to look at? Injection, spoofing. Notice that there is a physical supply chain. They started that last year. Uh, also, physical security and social engineering attacks. So, Slowly, this is starting to get developed. Um, this is an XML file. You can pull it back and dump it into a database and add your own like a lot of us have done uh, so that you can use this as a framework to understand really what is going on and how to do these uh, risk assessments. Back to here. Um, again, upside, XML helps you become educated on the attack postures if you're not really up on it. Some of the downside, um, MITRE is trying to use this as a <clears throat> crowdsourcing effort. So they really want your free help, although they fund it, or they're funded to do this, which is kind of a interesting thing. The mailing list, if you sign up for the mailing list, there's been no 
traffic on it for over a year and they really haven't updated it. But um, as of about two months ago, um, they're still talking about it at, the, at MITRE uh, when they discuss the uh, products that they uh, provide, the CVE and the other products, and they're still trying to promote people to spend time to fill in this information. So kind of upside and downside. And also I've heard from other people that they've tried to do very intense lookups, very experienced people, and this really only deals with the 50,000 foot range as far as ideas on compromise, so be aware of that. Another cat, ready? You guys, <laughs> meow. It's dire. Oh, just kidding. Yes, it does. <laughs> does it taste like chick? Oh, never mind. Okay, so <clears throat> the problem is um, current systems are based on a model that says I'm going to secure this system to whatever level. And then when I get around to it, I'll secure this system, and maybe or maybe not, I'll manage this system to the pr correct level. And maybe this and this may have vulnerabilities on it, but I don't actually look at the interactions between those because our compliance really says I'm going to secure this to a compliance level, I'm going to secure this to a compliance level without really understanding what that interaction is. Um, so the second thing is this, this risk process is really tedious, it's real expensive from a staffing standpoint. Justifying this for a lot of uh, clients if you, you have to do this can be, can be rather difficult because, well, they don't actually see a return on investment for them. Although there is, you know, it really makes sense. Requires uh, that are, uh, staff that are trained and have technical knowledge on what operating systems and routers and protocols and other things they're using. And the other thing is, um, the big problem is a lot of the tools out there aren't integrated into any frameworks. So I can't take my Visio and spit it out and give myself scripts for Metasploit. I can't spit it out and give myself signatures I should be looking for in my IDS. Wouldn't that be a cool idea? You know, I, I have no real integration. Um, so, uh, you know, honestly, I like to make my job easy, both on the offense and defense. I like to try to automate as much as possible. So I created questions for myself. And I did this uh, just before Christmas. Um, if I had full knowledge of all published vulnerabilities on the network, and also that full knowledge means I know where every device is. I have IPv4 addresses on everything. I know where the NATs are. I have full visibility. Um, how could I effectively use this knowledge to benefit me if I'm doing a penetration test? Me, if I'm doing defense and I want to actually have full awareness of what's going on. Me as a forensics engineer, that I can say, this system was popped and the most obvious three systems that would have left to that, led to that compromise are these three systems. So instead of going through logs of hundreds of other systems, this points me to those three systems. And also from an architectural standpoint. How can I maintain a secure architecture with more than one system, with more than one business process that is thrown on the network and you think, you know, everything's good because they did this and they did this? And by the way, this works very well for cloud, too. How do you ensure that that's actually from a risk assessment done? I also said, how if I only had partial knowledge? I mean, how many organizations really keep full real-time context of what's on their network today? Can you say that at this moment in time you had X amount of this box or that box or this amount of printers or that amount of printers at any one time throughout your environment? I don't think a lot of us can do that still, even though a lot of us spend a lot of money on tools to do that. So this would benefit the, both the attacker especially if they're going through a, a, a network, which Rob was defining, you know, you go in, you start, you know, enumerating the local services, maybe in core. That information then provides you a mapping that you can determine where the next place is to jump into or pivot from or whatever. Or again, from a forensics. And then honestly, again, I'm, I'm lazy. I want to automate this process so I can make my life more fun. So we're going to talk about some of the tools that are available. This is the only one I was able to find in an open source environment. 
Um, I've been playing with it now for three weeks. I've added additional data fields and other things. Um, if anybody's interested, probably the February 15th or so, I will be posting what my updates are to make the tool faster, easier, cooler. But we'll just talk about it very quickly. Um, what this guy does is it takes your Nessus vulnerability scans, both network-based and when it logs into the system, when it authenticates to the system, it only associates CVEs, which is kind of a problem. This is what I've actually been doing is trying to build up a database. It also allows you to log into Sidewinder and Checkpoint, pull the configurations, count how many NAT devices, how many NAT devices are supposed to be on that network. It pulls the current CVE to try to do matching. It also pulls the uh, NVD database, so it can provide, again, some more of the more leading edge processes. The CVE is a great database, but sometimes it lags other databases. Um, it then allows us to build a model in memory and a graphic. And at this point, I have the ability to say my starting point is maybe the edge of the network. Or maybe my starting point is the database because maybe the database server administrator just, just quit. What would be the impact of if they had access to just this? So you have the ability to essentially go around and start asking what if type questions. Um, it's relatively fast. Uh, it now checks for passwords, uh, credentials that are moved through the network, which is really nice. Uh, it's relatively fast, C, C++, scalable, um, and that's where the source code is. Okay, this is what the block diagram of the product looks like. I'd give a demo, but Rob said I only had 50 minutes and I'm probably going to run over, so picking on Rob. Okay. Um, this is really what the goal is, is the ability to take ICAT databases, oval databases, oval-based scanners. That's why we've been seeing all the vulnerability scanners been pushed into this process. So a, a bunch of interactive uh, rules, yes, it is prolog. It's better than it used to be. It was Lisp at one point. Um, a set of security policies that you, apl you apply based on your subnets and your devices. And then basically it does a TAC tree and some additional validation. It also pulls whatever network configurations you can plug into. Again, this is open source. NetSpal is really the number two that's discussed in the papers out there. Unfortunately, source is not available. It does exactly the same thing, um, but again, the source isn't available. Um, look familiar? Only difference is this is written uh, in a more optimized fashion. Uh, Garnet actually uses NetSpa. Uh, again, not open source, but want to make you aware if you're out there looking for it. Um, this is very cool because it has three models it works with. One is a simple attack. You know all the vulnerabilities on your network, so tell me what the risk are of those vulnerabilities. Hey, there's a zero day on my web server. What is the impact? That's a one-time zero day attack. So you can then start looking at and modeling what that problem would be. And the other would be comprehensive. What if there were really no upper bounds? Somebody threw maybe three zero days at me. What's the impact of those zero days? So these, this is pretty cool. Um, I'm hoping to get um, information back from MIT so I can take a look at the source. Um, emailed them a couple weeks ago and haven't seen it. Any response? Red Seal. Uh, they were really the first on the market to use these particular technologies. Has anybody heard of Red Seal? Is anybody using Red Seal? Okay. They're using this graph strategy to map your network. Uh, they pull your vulnerability information. They pull topology from uh, firewalls and routers. Notice that they're not pulling it from switches. So detection of layer two devices that may or may not be show up at layer three aren't detected. That was one of the, one of the findings I had when I did a gap analysis on all these tools. Um, 
It identifies exposed uh, exploits, um, has a nice little graphical interface, um, has a pri it prioritizes the vulnerabilities to try to get you to fix those. Uh, there is a cost. My review was real lightweight on this. A um, couple hours, I looked at some slides and some other things, some videos, and I talked to some people. This I didn't really go into depth and have my hand on this. But this is kind of interesting that we're seeing this technology implemented in these devices. By the way, this technology has been discussed for the last 10 years at IEEE and um, other um, engineering groups. Yes. And that's what an attack would look like. It has context on the network, and the orange actually identifies an attack vector. The nice thing about this particular example is I can point to that orange component as having the vulnerability that puts the other systems below it at risk. Yes, you must update your Cisco routing code. Skybox, another one. Uh, they, too, use the same technology, I think, based on licensing. I think they're licensing uh, the uh, MIT t tools at this point. They, instead of the um, Red Seal, uh, they have host-based captured tools. They have agents that they convince you to push on your systems. Um, their whole idea is reachability. They, they actually ping, they do trace routes, they do other things to try to identify the, the complete architecture of your environment. They do a lot of really nice what ifs. You know, what if this system was compromised? What if I had an exfil from this? What would I see? What if I had my printer compromised? What if, you know, the firewall is compromised? Lots of great what ifs that you could look at and determine what vulnerabilities you have. Again, it costs, and I have some additional future work on this to do. Uh, TVA, um, this at one point was open source. Uh, the company pulled it out of open source and is now turning it into a product. Uh, their big claim to fame is they pull the configuration files from PICs and ASAs, and also Cisco IOS, which is the only one in this category of tools, so that the Cisco infrastructure will report back what you have on your network so that's a big win it supports third-party vulnerability scanners unfortunately they haven't documented what that means and what product that is I mean is that nmap is that Nessus is that you know what is it uh, the output is they provide they they claim a common um, picture uh, they had no demos they had no pricing they had nothing and they haven't gotten back to me Okay, so how would I use these tools, sir? Uh, have you looked into Jim's plugin at all? Yes, I started down that path uh, yesterday because uh, I just read a paper from Usenet, Usenix about implementation of Cauldron, and they did actually a compare and contrast with Cauldron and Red Seal, but I haven't really chased that one down, but thank you, I'm going to add that one. Um, if I remember correctly, Cauldron has a, uh, yeah, this is Cauldron, TVA. Cauldron's TVA. Yeah, that's the product that was pulled off. Let's see, some of the uses of this. Um, and this is why I'm looking at the open source product. Wouldn't it be nice if you had a partial knowledge and you could generate a graph and say, here's the optimal path to compromise? Wouldn't it be nice if you could say, hmm, here's the optimal path to not be detected based on public information that you they're using this snort, this snort or Cisco or this product or that product. The other thing is, and I heard this from both Chris and several other penetration testers, this documentation is a total pain in the ass. To be able to provide a customer a graph of their network and show the path through the network that they took to re reach their goal. And then to be able to show, not only was this 
also exposed, but here's all of the other systems that could have been compromised if we had more time and money. So from a documentation, it really motivates the client to say, hey, this is real important, especially based on time. And again, documentation would be really nice, especially with Armistead, um, to be able to have it generate that information so graphically you could, you could maintain context. Uh, for a defender, being able to run this on your network on a regular basis and see if lows and moderates actually put your systems at, at uh, risk. And also, if I'm putting these, this new group of business systems in, how does that change or upset the security of my overall network? I mean, we've all been pushed to you know, put this web server or that email server or whatever in our network and not know what the heck it is until the CNA process or they finally come around to a compliance test or whatever. Um, this should be able to give you a heads up on this process. Security architects, you know, to be able to design guides, make, make uh, placement controls. I need to have a control here because we have this class of uh, systems that are potentially comp that could cause compromise. Um, I've used it once on documentation for compliance, which was nice. Um, and then also justify additional controls. Hey, maybe I need this additional firewall here, or I need additional access control lists here. For an incident handler, the ability to see a compromise and be able to pull up a graph and have a graph state that the optimal attack is probably from these three systems that maybe you don't even know about two of them. So, and also where next to look, uh, if you've been through system logs, it's a total pain in the butt to go through a system log, especially if you have 50 or 60, and especially if your sim doesn't process them for 45 minutes until you can actually do queries against them or something. This would allow you to very quickly go and pinpoint that system log before it's processed. Um, and also document zero days. So, oh yeah, and it's pretty pictures. That always justifies uh, law of security. Pretty pictures and numbers justifies bigger funding. So I want to mention this. Um, I'd never heard of this before, but as I was doing this research, I found it kind of interesting. This is a tool that does a analysis before and after you load an application so that you can identify additional surface attack areas that may have been opened or is, are now closed. So kind of a cool, cool idea. Okay, research. So I've decided to use uh, the multi-host, multi-stage vulnerability analysis tool. And I'm trying to figure out which toolkit that, that we currently use, um, um, open source toolkit to integrate this with first. Um, also, if you guys have input into additional vulnerabilities you'd like to see, if you could email me, that would be great. Um, I'd like to start building a database a little bit bigger that's functional. Um, identify additional tools. One of the things I wanted to do was to identify uh, NMAP scans and other things from a defense standpoint so I could look at those and see how they would flow through the network. Um, processing. Um, some of the tools provide real-time um, updates which is what a pen tester would need is, you know, I, I pop a box, I enumerate the box for information it knows about the network. If I can drive that back into a table to show me a new network map and potential vulnerabilities, so then I can very quickly optimize to just the compromise I want to use to just the next hop. Makes sense. Um, let's see. Um, Identify multiple routes, some, some additional uh, algorithms. Some of the algorithms are wonderful, but they're made only for defense. They're not made for forensics or other things. And an output. It would be really nice to have this output to Armitage uh, to generate the red team mapping, um, generate a my system was compromised, you know, what I, this system was compromised, what are the optimal paths that they use to get in or what are all the paths to get in. And also 3D interaction. Uh, 
can't see that yet. Um, some of the gaps I found with these tools, okay, I'm gonna use the word twice. No IPv6 support, no multicast support. Um, the vast majority of them, uh, the generation, you have to have a pretty beefy box to generate the graphic once it gets above 254 um, devices on a network. If you're doing 20,000 or 200,000 devices, it may take some time to process, so it, you're gonna either have to divide the load or do something. Also, unless it can see through a NAT, it has no context of the NAT at all, unless it can see a layer two connection of some sort. And again, there's a lot of products that don't interface with this particular toolkit. Okay. More than one way of skinning a cat. And because Tuna's not here, I had to put a poop joke in, just one. Um, so if you have any ideas or think that there should be some additional tools um, connected to this or if you think this would not be valuable to the community, um, any ideas, resources that you guys know of, interest, beer, code, my beer, money, whatever. Um, I think I actually got it done in a half, 45 minutes. Yes, no? Okay, end of presentation. Um, any questions? I mean, I tried to blow through that. I tried to go from high level to medium level without going into the bits. Not this time, though. Questions? Do you guys see this as a valuable tool? Okay. You ever heard of an, uh, it was, oh, eight years ago or so, it came out as Silent Runner. Uh, yes. It was uh, obtained by a company called Net Forensics uh, that was eventually not just visualize it in picture, but be able to do it in 3D and in um, animation over time. Um, and uh, it was actually an amazing tool at the eight to 10 years ago when I first huh. saw it at, at a NIST conference. Uh, but, and I purchased it from the company I was with at the time a couple of years later uh, before it got taken over by CA. do within an hour of reviewing that visual output what it would take literally weeks of man time to do looking through the packet uh, for it. Cool. I'm going to document and do some research on this. By the way, I've tried other products to do a regeneration of a network and the last very well-known, very expensive product written in Python uh, to regenerate a network could take 45 minutes, even on a, a multi-core processor, um, large memory space. So I've attempted this over the last few years to try to find something that would regenerate a network, and these are as close as I can come from a tool standpoint. Other questions or comments? So that uh, miner process, you said eight volts? Yes. That's the sum total of what they have. Um, they're, tr they're trying to crowdsource it. I mean, I mean, it's a great idea. Oh, there is actually some expansion you can, uh, I think they have, let me get back to the past the cats. Past the cats, past the cats. Oh, wrong one. Oh. They have a total of 386 attack patterns right now that are high level pa attack patterns and uh, they've tried to leave enough category enough space for everything else but this this is an opportunity to either grow for the community or create some custom stuff. If you just pulled out your watch it must be time for me to leave. No way. Yep. Remember this That's date. Why we started yours. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> you said I had 50 minutes. Okay, any other questions? Graphy thingy? <laughs> Glad you listened to the talk. Yeah. Let's see. To log back in.